Hi everyone and welcome to the Avid CNC live stream. I'm Sammy. I'm joined by my co-host Corey from Avid CNC and we are out so pleased to have David Stanton with us today. You're up here. <laughs> Uh, Dave is a professional woodworker. Uh, you also produce YouTube videos, which are fantastic. And uh, you also are a CNC user as well. So uh, can you give us a little bit of your background? Uh, you're also based in Australia. So another one of our uh, international users and representing the international community for us here. Um, can you give us a little bit of background on, on you and what you do? I can indeed, Sam. Are you you staying with us or are you going to... Oh, I just had to turn my there? heater off. I didn't want to... Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for everyone around the world, you guys uh, in the States, you're at midday at the moment at seven o'clock in the morning tomorrow. So if you want any lotto numbers or anything like that for <laughs> yesterday's draw, just ask. I'll see if I can get it for you. <laughs> um, my, my history. Well, uh, let me see. I guess it starts off. My father was an engineer, mechanical engineer. And uh, I managed to score a carpentry apprenticeship when I was 16. And so I had it in, in the blood, I guess, that you know I wanted to be able to discover and go forwards and create and work out why things happen. And uh, one thing led to another. I had a construction company. It wasn't big. It was only a small one. We built homes for people around this area uh, in the Blue Mountains. And uh, then I decided to look after my body because as I was getting older, you hear of a lot of builders whose knees go on them and all their joints fail. So I got out of the game when I was 50, kind of self-preservation mm -hmm. thing. And then I decided to work for a uh, store that sells machinery. You know, I thought I'd be able to help people out with my experience as to what they could get down the track. Uh, and that worked well. And then one thing led to another. I fell in love with joinery a whole lot more than the carpentry side. And uh, I thought, you know, there's a lot of people ask me questions. How about I try and answer questions on mass via YouTube rather than one on one? And that's where it started off. I followed a few few guys like Mark Spagnolo, uh, the Wood Whisperer. Yeah. Uh, he was pivotal for me getting started with this kind of thing. Um, and it's funny, you know, as I'm going along, I, I love to, still to watch him, but I don't want him to have too much fame. I'd like to get a, a bit of that fame as we're going along. Uh, and so then one thing led to another and using the different machines that I've got here and the different hand tools, the CNC obviously came up on the horizon and it was something that I'd never actually anticipated. Uh, and I kind of fell into it. It was uh, it's one of those things that, the software, I, I was very comfortable with Photoshop, so I thought I'd be okay with some of the other software. I ended up going with Avid, sorry, um, with, uh, that's you guys, of course, with um, Vectric and using Aspire. Uh, VCarve Pro would have probably done me, but I've got Aspire. Uh, and I'm still at the 2D stage. And it's, it's a thing where at the beginning, I, I, I focused and engrossed myself in, in learning the software and how to use the CNC and made a truckload of act, uh, mistakes and had my fair share of accidents as everyone's going to. Uh, not, I haven't damaged myself, but you know, sending off the machine without holding onto it is a different story to someone that's been used to hands on all his life, trusting and ha having my hand over that emergency stop button <laughs> for the first, for the first few months was big time. The, uh, the thing that then was to bring the CNC in, integrated into a tool path. Like you've got different cutters you'll put in the CNC to do a different job. Well, the CNC machine itself then became one process of everything that was happening in the workshop. Like I, I make a few things, the main cutting and shaping and everything happens here on the CNC. I'm actually right in front of the machine. I'll spin it around this way a little bit. So. I don't know if you can, uh, probably losing me too much there. Anyway, you can see the Ten Commandments, everyone be good. <laughs> uh, so, the, I'm, actually, that's not working too well. I'll come yeah. back here. The, uh, it's, the, from there, I'll, I'll take it to a, a, a router in a router table um, to, to do work on the underside of a job. And then I'll, I'll sand and all that kind of stuff that's conventional uh, to, to get the result. But, 
basically this thing creates a blanks for me. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pattern blank, take it out of the machine and away I go on the next process. So it's to anyone who's interested in getting one, it's, it's scary as all hell at the beginning, but give it, give it a month or so. And it just becomes as intuitive as picking up a hammer, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's really, I know it sounds like a throwaway line. It's not hard, but it really isn't hard. Depending on your leaning, if you, if you don't lean towards doing software at all and Photoshop leaves you for dead or, or other things, well, maybe it's not your cup of tea. But if, you, if you're comfortable, most people are comfortable do, using a Word document. If you're comfortable doing that and using drop-down menus and all that kind of stuff, well, Vectrix uh, software is totally based around that. And it's dead easy when you get past the fear section. Mm -hmm. Is that enough of the uh, of the beginning of my ramble? Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's wonderful. So I just want to say uh, welcome to thank you everyone who's tuning in. Olivier, thanks. We have more international folks. If you're here, let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions for Dave throughout, uh, please drop them in the chat, and we'll be happy to uh, to let him know. Um, so I'll come down. Here. Right, that was a really great. We you know learning about how you. Uh, really your path in CNC kind of how you got into it. I think it's really uh, as we've talked about before um, It was really tied to a product you had begun to develop and that's the Stanton bench if anybody um, Is not familiar. I, I believe I've linked to it in the description below um, So you started to develop the bench before you had access to the CNC machine kind of with more um, traditional woodworking and then when you integrated CNC into your workflow, it really opened up some doors and some possibilities in terms of production, repeatability, um, and able to really bring it, it to market. Can you tell us a little bit about how that path like really benefited kind of the, the uh, how your business grew and really how you integrated it into your workflow? That's a good, que good question, Sammy. Um, yeah, at the beginning, a lot of people who watch my channel were watching me develop this bench. Now, I'll, most people would be familiar with uh, Festool's MFT3, which is basically a, a, a slab of MDF that's got perforations at a regular interval. It's extremely square. You know, you can use a track saw on it. You can do, do all sorts of processes on it. And it's, um, I, I just found that it, there was a couple of things there that, could be improved on. And one of the big things about mine is that it's got a drop down apron on the front. So it's, it's a foot deep, basically 300 millimeters deep, which allow, and the, the dog holes are all perfectly in line across the bench top and down that front of that apron. I'll show it to you a little bit later on. But the thing that I'm getting at here is I used to do all that using a, what's called the, the path guide system, which gives you very, you know, very accurate stuff and it's economical to buy, but a lot of people would get into it. So it'd be a, it's a one-off thing and they think, oh, do I really need to spend that money on just a one-off tool? But don't be surprised at how often they'll use it. The, um, it's, so I was drilling these 20 millimeter diameter holes with a drill. So this was taking a long, long time. And then I started working out how to try and join it using, um, manufactured dogs that, I, that I'm getting now, sorry, legs to lock the apron onto the bench. And it was, it was fine, but you know, I couldn't look at doing that in a commercial situation mm -hmm. because it was too slow. It would take possibly a day to make one bench. Now with the setup that I've got here with the CNC and because I've created on this foil board, there are regular dog holes plus also down here, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. That is a captured captured nut mm -hmm. inside there. A threaded so they're insert. A diff yeah, threaded insert. So they're at different points all over the, the machine, and which allows me to bring a board onto the machine, send the machine around to put in 16 holes to start, that line up with those threaded inserts. I adjust the position of the board. I use... Um, I'll, See if I've got any over here. Well, I, ha I haven't, but I'll, I'll show you in a minute when I get sure. the, uh, the the bench out that, uh, or the, uh, let me say, the roll around cabinet that runs the whole 
the whole system for me. Uh, they go down through these holes and they lock the sheep down. Now, one of the important things when working with plywood is because the machine is running off a gantry above the sheet, not a router sitting on the sheet and following the surface, I have to pull that board down dead flat. Otherwise, when I'm working to half a millimetre tolerances, it's not going to work if there's a cuff in the board. Uh, so the CNC has been fantastic. I can punch out eight benches a day instead of one. Um, and that is a huge, like it's a long day, but it's a still, it's a huge turnaround. So the machine also using the, uh, the different feeds and speeds, which is if you're not familiar with CNC, it's one of the first things you're going to have to learn uh, to get chip flow rather than dust. See, these things aren't really, when you're using a handheld router, you don't notice these things. Yeah. You, you, you turn the router on and away you go and it makes a screaming noise. And at the end of it, you've got a nice slot. <laughs> so, but this thing, you, it's, it's a little bit more involved, but it's, it's great. I, I, I really love it. So yeah, the, the CNC from going from um, just doing it by hand all the way through, which I can still do, that the improvement on speed and accuracy and repeatability, as you were saying, mm -hmm. Sammy, it's it's a huge step, massive step. Awesome. I'm anyway. I'm loving the um, maybe very uh, variable um, ter terminology from international. So did you ch say chip flow or chip load? Yeah. Flow. Chip flow, chip load. Oh, okay, I, 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 no, I haven't look, heard that one. I still only do your. You're the professional here. I, I'm just a novice. Well, no, I, I uh, love that there's always so many different terms that can mean the same thing. You know, it's a, a past depth, depth of cut. You know, there's lots of different terms that we use. And I think it's good to uh, be open to learning new terms and um, different kind of colloquialisms. So awesome. Um, uh, so, Sammy, you know, before we even started the show, I was talking about making up words like magnetable. <laughs> I, if I if my brain can't think of something, it'll make it up on the go. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I'm I'm here for that too. I think that's something I, I definitely do a lot. Um, so, when you were getting started with CNC, uh, how how did you really deal with your early mistakes? Kind of the mistakes that you would um, make, and how would you kind of get through those? Okay. I had a lot of support from Nathan at the Avid. So any time that I ran into a headache, um, I I'd, I'd sent off an email or, or a Skype meeting and, and Nathan was in there straight away. Yeah. Um, and I, I've, I've just been interrupted on the phone here by something that some people might be interested in in Messenger. It's coming around. It's, you appear in this video. Uh, you might be interested. Don't click on it. It's a it's a virus. Oh. So that, that's just something that popped up in the corner of the phone. So your viewers might be interested in in knowing that. Yeah, um, be, be aware so, yeah, of those so getting things. Back, um, well, yeah, next week uh, back, was that Nathan? Right. So next week on the live stream, we have uh, we're going to have a few folks from the support team, Corey, and uh, a few additional folks that we'll be bringing on, so you can bring all of your questions for the team, uh, the customer experience team. They are the ones who help you uh, with quotes, custom quotes, shipping quotes, tech support, um, you know, walking you through all those different processes and, you know, assistance that we give to Dave, you know, we give to every customer. So we're really try to show up for everyone. Your success is our success too. We, we are really invested in um, making sure that everyone has uh, the ability to be able to get in touch with us and uh, so come come next week for the support team live stream as well <laughs> yeah, i think i'll be watching that one as well sammy it's uh I, I think it's something that is is important and i've i've never felt alone mm -hmm. if i could put it that way when i'm on this cnc journey uh i if something happens i think to myself well i don't think to myself well that was a waste of time I think oh, let's move on. I'm sure there's got to be an answer for it. And also there's um, some of the, the different forums as well. Like uh, I can jump into a forum for Vectric or I can jump into a forum for, for other companies 
And there's so many people have had that previous hiccup, let's say, and I can learn from them. And, I, and then you, you, you get it. And it's one of those duh moments away you go. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, uh, we're, you know, in this machinist journey, I really think it is a true art form. And part of that is kind of developing some of your questions as they uh, uh, kind of make themselves available. You don't know all the questions to ask before you've kind of experienced some of those moments, Dave. And I feel like it's really important that we give access to people to have conversations you know, looking up information is always uh, a good way to kind of self-teach, but having a conversation, we always feel allows for us to absorb more around the entire subject than just fixing that one issue. And the more you can absorb around that subject, the better programmer you can be, the better operator you can be, the more successful your your manufacturing process can be. Yeah. Um, I did mention to Sammy that I've built this cart for the CNC. Now, in, in my particular environment here in my workshop, I don't have any cables touching the floor from the from the actual machine. Mm. I've got them all zip tied up off the floor because I'm a clean freak. I like to run the vacuum underneath the machine. There is no dust under my CNC. I'll show you. Beautiful. You can eat off that <laughs> You could. You could. So these, these two wires here just pull up and they connect into the computer. Mm -hmm. And so the computer, you can see over here, all of my cables are up off the floor, zip tied awesome. and down the back and they come up right at the back. There's a couple of cables going up to a, a four point uh, electrical point there. Yeah, well, it's a good and time to say our, our machines you know, are, are uh, ready to be plugged in worldwide. So uh, 110, 220 volts, uh, 50, 60 hertz. Uh, 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 it can be configured with a new plug and, and yep. plug in anywhere in the world. I did have to put an Australian plug on it. And yep. there was a couple of little things because the wiring code in America or the United States is different. Your hot wire is white. Our hot wire is brown mm. or red. So different codes, but it wasn't too hard for me to put those on. I, I think I talk you through all of that in the video that I did of assembling this machine. Yes, you so did. down here, down here, we've got this cart that I built. Beautiful. And it's on. Now, on the those back wheels are straight. The front ones are rotating casters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reason being, as I slide it under, I don't want to have to wrestle with them with the cart at all because it's heavy. And I don't want to go bumping the legs on the CNC. So it comes around to the front here, like so. So that's, that's how it's set up. Awesome. And this is the cart that contains yeah. all of your CNC related tools and um, everything like that, right? Yeah. So. The laptop lives here. It just comes straight straight up on the top. Mouse and what have you there. Uh, these plastic dogs, you hit those with a cutter, it's not going to worry anything. Mm -hmm. Just destroy this. Um, all the bits that I use, nice big surfacing bit. Awesome. And these guys here, which I shall show you. So I did say I've got captured or oh, sorry, insert nuts. Mm -hmm. These things are 20 millimeters diameter there. They are around 16 millimeters deep in this section here, because I use 18 millimeter ply. The holes are already positioned. This thing goes into it, onto the piece of ply. I put an Allen key in there in a screwdriver and pull it down and then I just give it one or two more turns and it pulls the sheet down tight. Nice. Mm -hmm. So they are all over this. They're all over the whole whole board. And every now and then I have to replace an insert because the small board being MDF, sometimes it'll get a bit of a bite on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so th this works really, really well. And one of the other things I've done with my spoil board is you'll notice on the corner here, 
where the sensor is, I've got, I've made this to protect it. Mm -hmm. And also to protect young people coming in so they don't smack into anything on the corners here. It's, it just makes it a little bit more human friendly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Those are our previous right. revision sensor kit. Uh, nowadays, that sensor is on the gantry riser, uh, and there's just a little flag there on the corner of the machine. So that sensor is now tucked in uh, on, the, okay. on the gantry system. Is it like a right angle sensor instead of sticking out? It's a little block sensor, Dave, and so yeah, okay. so it it isn't cylindrical in shape. It's a little block, and and it bolts right to the aluminum gantry riser system. And so, right. you can see this in uh, our assembly documentation. And there is an upgrade okay. path if people are interested in changing over to that newer sensor style. And adjustments pretty easy on it. Yep. Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I don't know what else is there like. I, it's going to be only so many times you can see a uh, CNC and think, oh, wow, that's new. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yours is there's, very there's clean. So I, I love how tidy your shop always is. And that's definitely, you know, hashtag you. shop goals, you know, so uh, we're inspired. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right. Well, did you want to have a look around the rest yeah, of the shop while I'm at around. the stage or did you want to ask me some more questions? All right. Well, this area here that I'm in is a six by six meter room. Basically, it's a double garage. So six by six is 20 feet by 20 feet. You can see down the sides there. And then off the back of it, so that's that's out to the rest of the property. And then I'm gonna spin you around without you getting too giddy. This is kind of a skillion extension off the back. And it's, uh, it's a bit of a mess at the moment. But not to worry. Um, just conventional tools on the walls that I used to use a lot when I was in construction. Uh, things that I've been making, like this, this is another bench that organizes all of my sustainers. So they're on all soft clothes. Um, down the bottom, I am thinking about putting some, um, maybe some angled pieces of timber to put, say, two inch thick polystyrene underneath so i can throw that up on top for cutting um, i've got an mft style uh, set up on the back so i can drop this down and run the track saw over it mm -hmm. this is not a t-track this is actually a a, um, a resin pour oh. that i cut out with a router and everything so my wife also uses this for cutting material for dressmaking cool. mm. so it's uh, that's something I've, i'll do a video on that further down the track um, another cart like the one I had out there, which is for the lathe and the Sorby Pro Edge. This is a fantastic sharpening machine. Um, this is the actual bench. This is the Stanton bench here. Uh, it, it just works so well. It's got a T-track in the top and in the front. All of these holes are at 96 millimeters and all of them chamfered with the CNC. The, so the CNC did all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, down the side here, it's all rounded so that people don't you know, bump into the things again. Uh, you can flip it over and it doesn't have the rubber inserts. These things are a non-slip, so I can uh, put timber on that and sand it. It's not going to go anywhere or route it, whatever I want. Uh, down the side here, the workstation where the capex is. And spare blades. Uh, Oh, a project I did with the CNC. Sammy's got a video or a link there, I think, to this one. This is a hand plane, dis hand plane display I made. So this is all, all been CNC'd and resin in there. Mm -hmm. And all of these are held on by rare earth magnets. Each one of the planes has got its number. That's a 4.5, so it's a, a four and a half. These are all Australian planes. Modeled on Stanley, and they sit there quite nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is my great grandfather, who was a carriage builder. That's his wow. parents as well. And so I have his toolbox and his bench, and so you can see into there. Wow. All of the gear. And yeah. 
You know, just going through your shop from here, Dave, going to the CNC and, and through these, you know, traditional hand tools and then yep. uh, more traditional mechanic mechanical tools and, and powered tools and then the battery operated tools and then the CNC, right? From where you kind of are standing, I really appreciate that, you know, uh, it's this ecosystem that you're using. It's not one or the other, but it's the different tools Correct. being used together in order to achieve, you know, the goals of that particular project. Yeah, it's, um, the, as they all work together. The recent thing, I had a history steeped in using hand tools and everything as an apprentice. You know, we weren't allowed to use the power tools at, at 16 years old. <clears throat> so we had to, had to learn that part to start. And these things stay with you as you go through life. I'm not telling anyone anything. This, the skills that you acquire when you're young, particularly they, they reckon the best time to learn a foreign language is when you're going through your teens, because it's something that just stays there. Uh, and hand tools, of course, yep. This is a hand plane that I built, which is uh, absolutely beautiful. It's got a yeah. 90 degree fence on it. And it was a lot of fun making it. And they're not hard to do. Veritas have got a kit for them. So they supply the hardware. You make the, the wood part. <laughs> it's not that yeah. hard, but very, very rewarding. Um, okay, so here, this this is another bench that's covered in rubbish at the moment. But this part here, let's see if I can push these back. This part here pulls out. And so there's a trim router in there at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I also put that guy in there, which is a pneumatic Craig Foreman. Cool. And for pocket so holes? Can, for pocket holes, yeah. So yeah. I set this whole bench up. This this bench is two millimeters lower than the, the out feed for the saw table or the table saw. So it, uh, everything everything just lives in here dead easy. So small, large. It's, uh, it's very, very enjoyable. Also, clamps. I love my clamps. <laughs> it, it's the kind of thing I do pocket off construction. Yeah. So it's just it's just a drawer. Is that how you build most of your drawer control. boxes? I build all my drawers that mm -hmm. way. <clears throat> so all of these ones here, this is under my drum sander. They're all pocket mm -hmm. hole construction, but looking at it, you wouldn't you can't see any of them. Yeah. Because all the pocket holes are not here, they're on the other mm -hmm. side behind the drawer front. And at the back, they're all on the back of the drawer, mm -hmm. but underneath. So the base of my drawers is 16 millimeters. So they don't bow. So I can, I can build a drawer four feet wide. Mm -hmm. Like all the drawers on my roll around cart, this one here, yeah, They're 16 all, millimeters is about three quarters of an inch. <laughs> five eighths. Five eighths, yep. Yeah. yeah, five eighths of an inch. So they're solid. And it, it's all chipboard, mm -hmm. you know, like it's melamine chipboard. And some people say pocket holes won't work with melamine or they won't work with plywood bulbs. I'm here to tell you they do. <laughs> <laughs> Not awesome. A Have you ever used the uh, Vectric uh, box gadget? No, I haven't. Oh, well, lucky for you, we have a video on Tuesday coming out about how to make, I think it's a great alternative for uh, folks who don't have a full traditional setup with table saw and all of these other tools. Yeah. Um, it's a great plugin that Vectric has on their website and you just enter in the uh, dimensions of your box and it can make either uh, CNC dovetails or CNC box joints and it's a really, um, it's a neat tool, so we have a little video coming out next week about how to do that. I'm very curious about that because unless you can get a piece of timber vertical on the end, like Jay Bates and a few others have done, and do all the work there, pardon me, how does it do it on the flat? If I've just got one sheet on the flat, can it can it do dovetails and box joints that yeah, way so or not? Yeah, so you, you will use an eighth inch question? bit. Uh, so it has a very, very tiny dog bone yep. so it has a very tiny All reveal right. okay. but when you look inside the drawer you won't be able to see any joinery but on the outside you'll see those box joints but they're almost so small that you can't really notice them depending on the tool that you use 
Okay, so I, on the last video that I saw Jay doing a fit out for one of his mates' fans, I think he did dog bone uh, corners on that as mm -hmm. well, because it was all kind of mortise and tenon work that he was doing as far as plywood was concerned. So that's very interesting. I'm going to have to watch yeah. that. I'm going to have to watch it. So I'll be I'll be waiting here. Perfect. For Sammy, well, it's premiering it at 10 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesday, so see you there. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I just thought I'd share 10 that. 10 a.m. That'll be five o'clock in the morning for me. Okay. Okay. You get a you get a pass this time. You showed up this morning bright and early, and we appreciate that. I'll watch the record. That. I'll watch the record. Uh, oh, can I also say I was fascinated with Olivia's um, uh, video that you the previous live stream that you yeah. did uh, in France. And uh, th that teardrop trailer is, uh, that's, that's a, a work of love, I'm sure. You know, to have the patience to be able to work your way through that uh, prior to having the CNC, I believe, when he was talking about it, he started. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also having the, the workshop so close to his house or part of his house, mm -hmm. that's something people say to me, oh, well, you, it's so fortunate having a separate building to be able to do this. But... Sometimes it's not nice in the middle of winter trying to go from one building to another. It'd be nice just to be able to sit, sit down, have dinner, say goodnight to the kids, then zap around into the yeah. workshop and keep on having fun. Yeah. It was very inspirational. I know. I love the teardrop trailer. It's been kind of um, a dream project of mine, CNC project at least. Uh, but to put the, a bench top machine in it so I could just pull my bench top with me, you know, do a little pop up event and have it um, cutting or something like that. So. Uh, it the teardrop trailer would be a perfect CNC project as well, um, or at least components of it. Um, all right, well, so anybody if, uh, in the chat, let us know if you have any questions for Dave, and we're happy to uh, pass them on here. I've... Yeah, Mike has one here, uh, and he was asking the tipping point for you doing this was your bench, and so we know that that production capabilities was kind of like what got you into it, but what determines when you use the CNC versus some of your other tools in, in, in your shop there, Dave? Is there a tipping point or a particular aspect yeah. of a project if, that you need um, to, to, to use the CNC on? If I want something to be really accurate straight off the bat, well, then I'll spend, I'll spend you know, 15, 30 minutes in front of the computer and, and design the thing or it, it, they're... Um, CAD area um, and especially if I want it to marry up with something that's been done already if you have a look at the video that I did on the Turner hand planes each one of those pockets I got a far better result and in the long term it was a quicker result using the CNC than trying to create templates for the router a handheld router to follow um, also with that when I did the resin pour to the, the red resin or raspberry colored resin in, in the Turner logo. Now, you've got to be aware Turner was finished in 1970, so I'm not advertising for a company or anything. It's a, it's a historical company that was in Australia it's long gone. Um, it's just that uh, I have a friend who's a collector of them and I got the bug from him and next thing you know, I've got the bloody things on the wall. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the resin pour that I did failed. So when I did it, there was a lot of bubbling in it because I hadn't sealed the edges of the area that I cut out and also the dye that I used was a water-based dye in the resin and so there was a bit of a reaction when it got to a certain depth mm -hmm. um, and so one thing with another it kind of boiled a little bit like a volcano and I've got this massive bubbler so I put the machine I put the board that display board that I'd already done the resin pour back on my spoil board and my spoil board having those points to reference off, I sent the CNC back in on those exact same coordinates and it did it to, the, the, it, there was no mistake. It was perfect. It went straight down in, cut out the resin for me. I didn't increase the size of the logo. I didn't make it look, it wasn't stepped away, you know, a millimeter away from the edge or whatever. It was perfect when it went down in there and did the machining in. And I took that board probably back, back to the CNC maybe three times to go over what I had done before. So it saved me. There was no way that I would have been able to do that with a handheld router. I, well, possibly if I, if you know, but it, it would not have been as accurate. So things like that 
I don't know if that's the tipping point, but you know, that was something that saved my bacon big time. Because you spent I spent a lot of time on this board. And I thought, no, I don't really want to stuff it up. And also when you push the start button and Mac 4, you get this nervous moment just for a second as the machine goes up and off she goes, and you think, please, please come down in the right spot. Um, yeah, Co tipping Corey point. calls that. So yeah. you say nervous, I say excited. I, I'm like, yes, it's working and uh, it's doing its thing. Uh, yeah. I, I, I do a big air punch a few times when it actually does it. <laughs> and I believe you're going to have mistakes. I don't care who you are. You're going to have mistakes with these things. And when it does go wrong, it happens very quickly. <laughs> so, right. But it's it's not the machine's fault. It's the driver error. And so my, my advice is do some small projects, have maybe four or five spare bits in the wings waiting because you're going to smash some. <laughs> You'll break them. And have your 10 uh, commandments or your 10 step checklist ready to just go through. That will help save you from many very easy mistakes that all of us have made. You know, most CNC technicians have made these mistakes and it's just... You know, no matter uh, if you've run that program a hundred times that day, you know, I used to do production where you have to make thousands of tap handles or products. Yeah, right, and, Sammy. you know, it's yeah, almost right. always that very last run, you're five minutes before you're going to clock out and you're too confident because you're like, I've run this. When you're a little too confident, just go through that list one more time, you know, or if you're nervous, that list yeah. can help you uh, give you a little boost, you know. I have never broken a cutter or made a mistake since I put the list mm -hmm. up there. It is crucial. And exactly what you were saying, you know, you get a bit confident, like I'll, I'll set a job up and I'm, I'm about to hit it. And I thought, think, oh, have I read? No, I couldn't be bothered. And I think, all right, stop for a second. Let's read it. I think, oh, gee, that's lucky I stopped. <laughs> wow, well, it was going to be terrible. Because there's so many other things going on in your mind that until it becomes basic, like, um, <clears throat> muscle memory almost, you know, like you get in a car and it's so automatic because you do it all the time, turn the brake off, put it in gear and away you go, ease the clutch out. But they're things that we, we just do automatically. Now, if you're using a machine, one of these things all the time, you're going to get there. But for me, it's, um, I'll, I'll use this, this machine might sit idle for maybe two months at a time. And the rest of the time, it'll be running for 10 hours a day. But it's, it's, it's like any other tool in the workshop. It's not, I'm not going to be using a handheld router every day. It's, it's not what I do. You know, it, this is a tool for a particular function and away we go. The, I'm still trying to get back to that question on the tipping point as to when I would choose to go down the path of the CNC. Well, let's use your drawers as an example. So we know your yep. drawers have some additional po post-processing with your pocket hole. But yep. if you were making two or three drawers, you know, is that the traditional tool route where you're breaking your sheet down with your track saw and your tape measure and, and measuring everything off? Or when you get to more than three or four drawers, you, 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 you know, take the time to draw that and, and cut it on the CNC machine? Or is there kind of as an example with, with, I think, with those? I think, I think if I was getting into more than, say, three or four drawers, yeah, I'd probably just start going down the track of using the CNC to cut them out. For, for one reason, I'm probably going to get a slightly cleaner cut, especially with a melamine finish, maybe running a quarter inch spiral down or a compression cutter. The uh, people ask me about compression cutters. I'd, I'd like to have a compression cutter that only had around about a three millimeter base that mm -hmm. was the up cut. And then all the rest was down cut because then I could jump in five millimeters, basically let, let's say we're talking about a little bit more than three sixteenths of an inch in, in your talk mm -hmm. as my as my first pass. I'm I'm not brave enough yet at this stage to to jump in and, and go a full five eighths of an inch in one pass. I, I think that's just going to be asking for uh, for for uh, well, a, yeah, bro we, a broken we, bit. <laughs> we talked about this a little in the plywood and plastics video, Dave, and and that is uh, set it up as two separate tool paths. So your first tool path that's going to be deeper, set it a slower feed and speed where we're not putting as much lateral force on the tool as the next tool paths that are shallower with just yeah. the upcut part of the tool and really focusing on chip evacuation. So those second and third or fourth passes uh, are going to be shallower and faster. 
but uh, and be encouraging chip evacuation deeper into that canyon. And so, uh, uh, you, compression tools are, are are something where yeah, you you, you got to have just the right recipe. But when you do, man, the cut quality and efficiency that those tools have on the top and bottom of your sheets is 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 really really great. Yeah, yeah. Sammy, you're smiling. There. I just love I love have? talking about uh, router bits and when to select the right one for the right job and the strategy to use them. Compression bits, I think I'm particularly, uh, I mean, love for, for plywood in particular, you know, when you get into hardwoods and you have to make that deeper uh, plunge on the first pass, it can be a little bit, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I just, yeah, I can't help but smile when we talk about router bits. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you, it's a sad, it's a sad situation, isn't it? <laughs> no, I'm proud of it. You got to wear it, wear it, uh, with pride. Yeah, go to parties and talk about compression cutters. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a, I think it, it's a really great thing where you get to come together and talk about those kinds of things. Like next week is, uh, Autodesk university. If nobody, if anybody's uh, heard about it, it's free and online. Uh, we just did the Vectric user group a few months ago, and that was an online uh, meetup where we uh, they had talks every day by makers, uh, professionals in the field, and uh, folks who were uh, representing different CNC companies. And it's just awesome to see folks get to come together. Like we get to come together every Friday and talk about, you know, talk with different makers or dive deep into. Uh, different types of the, um, th you know, things you want to learn and build on this skill set uh, that brings us here every week. So uh, I'm looking for, forward to getting to nerd out more about uh, different programs and CNC next week at Autodesk University. Uh, you also do a live, live show. Can you tell us about that and where everyone can t tune in? Yeah, well, the live show came about from, um, I think, I think some people were just wanting something a little bit regular. It didn't start off mm -hmm. as being every day. I, I decided to, instead of creating a, a formulated video that, you know, might be 10 minutes long, uh, not much chat, basically to the point, um, get the project done. And a lot of people like that stuff. And, and I do as well, but I thought, you know, there's, there's, Jay Leno and all of those, but not that I'm trying to associate myself with him, but people enjoyed a kind of a, a live, kind of a talk back mm -hmm. style thing. Where's that noise coming from, Sammy? Is that no, my end no, or I your think end? that's me. Right. Okay, that's better. Was that your shredder or something? <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted something that was going to be a little bit more personal. Now, there's a lot of people don't like it. And I totally get that. And there's a lot of people that say, don't ever stop the live show. It's, you know, it's a, it's an hour of in entertainment, a little bit of information, a bit of chat. They love to be able to also join in. Like I'm sure your, your uh, viewers at the moment are joining in with the chat session. I can't see any of that at this end. Um, now also I embed the chat. Now people have said to me, Dave, we're losing part of the screen because you're embedding the chat in mm -hmm. the actual video. Now, the reason I embed the chat there is because a lot of people will watch my show on a smart TV and you don't have the chat coming up in the side. Well, for me, the chat is, is, is a big part of what it's the community mm -hmm. of, of the people that are watching the show. Um, they, if I notice if the thing that I'm talking about is getting boring and you'll probably find the same thing right now. <laughs> if the thing, if the subject that I'm talking about or working on is boring, the chat comes to life. They all start talking to each other down the right hand side of the screen. And it's great because they are also helping each other. So they'll ask questions. If I haven't got time to answer, there's plenty of guys in there that will jump in with an answer or offer up a, su a suggestion. And I think it's really, really nice. I've been doing it for years and it's growing. So, you know, while the show's on, it could be anything between 80 people to a couple of hundred. Uh, but by the end of the week, by the time I hit the next show, um, it, you know, it might've got up to four or 5,000 people have watched it. Now, some people will skip through, they'll watch the record recording on purpose because they'll just skip through parts until they get to the interesting part for what they're actually looking for. Um, some people will just sit down with a beer or a coffee or whatever and, and put their feet up and have a bit of a giggle. Awesome. <laughs> Why not? 
Uh, well, we have, you know, speaking of community, uh, Chris Cap says, uh, great session, cutting out my stand bench on my Avid CNC this weekend. Um, awesome. You know, what a great way for us to get to come together and, and uh, hear about that. It's perfect timing. Uh, be sure to share that with us uh, coming up. Uh, yeah, I'm, I think, Dave, uh, what you're appealing to is that we all have different learning styles or are at different paths of a particular journey, right? Yes. And there's a lot of different yeah. journeys going on. And so we try to do this with our documentation and our tutorial videos and 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 these Friday videos as really kind of uh, having many different paths to learn the same subject manner and allowing people to choose the path that makes the most sense for them. And when we talk about something as intimidating as CNC, I mean, it, it's you really should pick the path that feels the best for you and that you can kind of be the most confident in. And if that do, means doing a lot of research beforehand and a lot of practice beforehand, great. If that means jumping into the deep end of the pool with, you know, uh, a, a good understanding of the big picture stuff, but really no research into the small details, whichever yeah. one makes the most sense for you is good going to be the one that makes the most sense for you. And we just want there to be resources available for people. And I feel like you 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 also take that approach when you talk about the resources and how you talk through things um, and present that information. I have to take it back. I, I don't presume knowledge on the person who's watching. I don't presume they know what I know. And I I also, I'm, I'm a babe in the woods as far as my knowledge in comparison to a lot of people out there. But I... I watch some videos and I think to myself, I'm, I'm fine. Like, give you an example. Vectrix videos are fantastic. But one thing I found, I was kind of stumped because I've got a keyboard in front of me. I'm brand new. I've got the program up, Aspire, whatever. And I'm, I'm trying to follow along and learn. And the person will be telling me everything. And I'm going along great. And then they say, escape out of there or get out of that. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, like like Homer Simpson, uh, push, push any button. Well, where's the any button? <laughs> I was looking for the escape button, but it was, you know, I, I, I wasn't told that's what I had to find. So I try and take that with me as well when I'm talking about things. And I've done a couple of videos on, on getting started with the Spire. And I will... I will talk every computer mouse movement, every button mm -hmm. I touch, I'll explain it. Uh, and, and so that the person's not kind of fall, it's like a trail of ants, you know, step off the scent and they're lost. You know, the, 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 the whole trail is only two inches away from them, but they can't find it. It may as well be from here to the moon. And that's how I feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I try and avert that for the, in the videos that I do that are specialized. In the in the uh, the live show on Sundays for for, for us it's Sunday at, at eleven for you guys it'll be around about seven or nine o'clock Saturday night I guess, but uh, and in England UK just does cannot watch it live because they're they it's two in the morning or something for them, <laughs> but uh, I taking it back to back to basics and especially with CNC, uh, it, it's a, it's a bit more specialised than tuning a hand plane put it that way. And if you, you you really do need to start thinking the way the people that have put the programs together, you've got to think along the same way as they do uh, because you, and there can't be any presumptions. Anyway, yeah, quick trick. Yeah. yeah, no, and, and some of those videos, when they are very detailed, a tip I like to use is some, YouTube has the playback feature and you can either slow down or speed up the playback. And so I like to set the tempo of the video with the tempo that I'm moving. So if yep. the person teaching me is going a little bit faster than I can click through or, or, or keep up with them, I slow the video down just so they don't leave me behind and I don't have to rewind and rewatch and rewind and rewatch. And the vice versa, if, if I kind of am very familiar with the software and I'm looking for a little tidbit of information, I'll increase the tempo of the tutorial video because I, I can go faster than, you know, their traditional uh, speed. And, and I love that playback feature. Awesome. We have one more uh, question here from Mike. Uh, what's the easiest or hardest, uh, easiest and hardest or frustrating material to work with on the CNC? So I guess this is kind of 
whatever your use case is, kind of the ones that you go to, um, uh, you tend to probably work with plywood fairly often. Uh, what is kind of the hardest and what is the one you use the most often, I guess? Um, the, the most often that I use is, is birch ply. Mm -hmm. um, and also I'll use uh, uh, high moisture resistance MDF. Both of those uh, are, are pretty easy to use, but I can't. I can't go. My my speed the, the, of the of the gantry and you know the travel the the, dis, the speed that the the um, the router is travelling at, or the spindle I should say on this particular one, that it's physically moving around the table. I think I've got to vary those a little bit for those two different types of product. Um, Timber, real, right, real wood. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty good, but again, you've got to be a little bit more conscious about climbing uphill on the grain and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you just have it, this comes through just doing it, and you you're going to pick out your best what they call feeds and speeds, uh, and chip e eviction or yeah. or chip flow or whatever you want to call it. Um, Try not to get dust, but even with MDF, you're going to get dust because there is no real thing to it. It's just pulp and glue. But the uh, the other thing with real wood, one of the things that I, I I had a bit of an accident. There's a video that I did on making a swing set for mm -hmm. the backyard here. And I cut out some things called angel wings. Now, angel wings are basically a brace unit that goes the diagonal brace unit like a gusset between the, the like a gusset yeah but there's no internal section to it so it's you know free form and it and it looks nice and shapely and all that kind of stuff well they the material i was using was 42 millimeters thick so let me see if i can change that maybe an inch and three quarters inch and five eight something thick mm -hmm. uh pine and the uh I had the dust boot on and I had a quarter inch cutter. Now the quarter inch cutters for timber can't be too long because you'll snap them if they're too long. There'll be too much lateral force on that thickness of, of material. Unless of course you're going into foam, they, they make special cutters that, for going into foam that can be six inches long. But uh, had the dust boot on and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, the machine was going along fine. And I thought, yeah, I, I know this machine, it's all good. I can walk out of the door now and just let it keep on cutting. First mistake. <laughs> so, it was merrily cutting. I had I was cutting uh, six, uh, four of them, I think, out of one piece of timber down the bed, and it was coming down to the last plunge. And it, because of where the the dust boot was on the machine, the dust boot actually caught a hold of the edge of the timber, and it's held on by magnets, dragged it off. And now I've, the machine, to its credit, finished the job, but my dust boot has never <laughs> been the same. There's cut marks all over it. Half the whiskers have gone. I'll grab it, I'll show you. <laughs> right, so I guess we'll we'll point folks towards. Uh, oh, look, look at that! <laughs> it's got a yeah. little love. So th that can happen. Mm -hmm. that, that's waiting for you if you're not focused, reading your Ten Commandments, and set things up properly the first time. And these these little things, you know, even though it seems scary, it really isn't. When you walk in the door, there's a shock. Oh my God, what what have I done? And then you slow down for a second, have a look at it all, and say, well. I'm still alive. The machine's still working fine. We've had a little bit of a, an incident, but I get that kind of stuff with ordering machines, like with with the, with my bandsaw or table saw or anything. I'll have a little error happen there, and you know, thank heavens, I'm good. But it's a power it's a power tool. Anything that's a power tool, even a chisel, I can cut this cut myself with. Anyway, so back to the question. Uh, if you hadn't noticed, I tend to go off course a fair bit. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> So I guess, right, materials, uh, Corey and I might put, point you towards chip load. Uh, Corey gave a talk about chip load is queen. Kind of just process, really, really looking at the quality of the cut, doing test cuts. Any Most materials should be approachable in the way that uh, you evaluate the kinds of making a really great educated guess testing it out and then making adjustments. So uh, you should be able to kind of work your way in, and that's for any kind of, right, as you call timber, you know, there's different uh, densities and grain quality and all different kinds of wood are gonna act, 
uh, react differently to cutters and different speeds mm -hmm. and speeds. So uh, taking those times and making those educated, informed guesses and then the tests and then uh, adjustments, right? Sammy, can I, can I jump in there for a second? A lot of people, me included, probably don't have enough of the material sitting around mm. to do a test cut. Now, the other thing is they've set the whole run up in their software and they they think, oh, you know, so I've got to actually make a test run program as well. So instead of doing 108 holes in a bench, I've got to do a test. Well, sometimes I'll do a test of maybe seven holes in one run of board and I'll increase it by mm -hmm. 0.01 of a millimeter diameter in each one until I get the perfect size. Then I can change them all. So I, it, it, it's very good to do what you're saying, but a lot of people are going to think, oh, look, let's just run it. Uh, and I, I do have with Mac 4 the capacity of slowing down or speeding up mm -hmm. the travel and also the spindle speed. And that's a really, really nice feature. I love that because I can watch what's happening. On, on I, the machine's talking to me basically as, as the cuttings are happening. I can go, uh, I'm not getting a good result here. Let's slow it down or, I'm, or I need to pick the speed up. Um, and, and I can look at the holes in the, in, that I'm creating it. If I'm seeing any stepping, obviously I'm getting flex in the cutter as it's going down and it's not, it's, I'm, I'm going too fast. I should allow it to do a proper cut. There's a whole heap of things that come into it. Mm -hmm. um, but setting it up and doing the test ones in an ideal world, yeah, I agree. But I'll tell you, it doesn't happen. I guess, I don't know. I <laughs> guess I've, I've worked in fabrication and production and I uh, would encourage you to, uh, I would always order 10% extra material, you know, because there's always going to, uh, whether it's CNC involved or not, there are always potential for things to be, oh, you know, you're doing a big glue up and there's a big knot here. So I have to yeah. cut that off for my glue up. So, uh, or having just scrap pieces of plywood or walnut or ash, you know, around whatever you're using, um, I mean, a smaller, smaller piece, not necessarily running your whole job and, and your, uh, example of the, uh, size for the dog holes is a great example. So if I'm doing a Dell test fit, I'll cut five different holes and see which one is the best fit. And then I'll cut my whole pegboard or whatever, yeah. uh, the project because, is. Because timber is a fiber and it's going to react to moisture. That's all mm -hmm. there's to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, just uh, I'll, I'll throw in an answer there for Mike's question of the, the most challenging materials, and that's materials that have internal stresses, for me at least. And so when you cut into something, whether it be plywood or dimensional lumber or timber, and just like any other tool, when you cut into that, it wants to move or that stress wants to be relieved because you've essentially created uh, a, a weak point, uh, uh, that's probably for me is is the most challenging material to work with. And so I try to be aware of that, just like I'm aware of it when I use the chop saw or the table saw. If I'm looking at something with grain direction and I can see the bow or the twist in yeah. in the rough cut lumber, uh, or you know, even in like, like a two by four, uh, you can see ones that are gonna stay relatively straight. And sometimes you can see that stress showing itself and that would probably be the most challenging material. So not necessarily a particular species of wood or type of material, but more of a material that has variables in it that are kind of unpredictable uh, would, would be my answer. Great. Uh, we have one more question, I think, before we sign off, because we're getting to about an hour here. Um, uh, there was a question from Ruben. Uh, are there threaded holes in the benches uh, as well done by the CNC? I think Maybe they're asking if there's threaded inserts in the bench. I believe that they're yeah. dog holes, right? I I do a three eighth inch hole. Uh, there's six of them in the top of the bench, and they are to take the same threaded inserts that I put in this board here. So it's an eight millimeter threaded insert. I drive that in after. This is all processing after the CNC as well. This is what I was talking about earlier. There's a lot of processes, um, and. Uh, they, they work fine, you know, there's there's no drama putting those in, but you, you, I use a drill to put those mm -hmm. in. Was there anything else, Sammy? Well, like I can be here all day. It's all right, we could do this you. all day. Well, we'll have to have you back again soon. 
Uh, Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next week, uh, same time. Uh, and we're very excited to bring uh, some more members of the Avid CNC team uh, to talk to you all. So we'll see you then. Thanks, Dave, so much for joining us. We appreciate it having you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. My, my pleasure. Awesome. See you later. Bye, everybody. everybody.